Okay, it's time to go ahead and get started. And we are going to be talking about some fun things tonight, talking about what we do in the wintertime to get ready for our gardens. And so there's eight things that I do that help people grow food. I actually have more than this, but these are the main eight things that I do. I've got my YouTube channel, and then I've got my free Zoom meetings. That's what this is tonight. And I record those, and those go on my YouTube channel every week. And so we have, I think tonight is the 34th one I've done. And so for the last uh, 34 weeks we've been doing this. I do this every Thursday night, but except for nights like maybe Thanksgiving or if I have a bad internet connection, because I do live in extreme rural America. I'm in the mountains of Nevada, and so sometimes the internet doesn't work as good as it should. And then I've got my Patreon class, and I'm excited because today we, well, like four days ago, we hit our 500 posts on Patreon. So today, with my post that went out today, I'm at 505 posts, so I'm really excited about that. Most of those are videos on how to grow food in my own greenhouse and on my uh, little farm here where I live. And then I've got my 17-week farmer training course. And that is all about um, teaching people the hands-on skills to grow food. If, they, if a person wanted to start a business um, growing food and selling food, this is the place to come and to learn those skills of how to actually grow the food. We don't go into a lot of the business stuff as much because that's easy to find in today's world. But we are all about the production. And then I'm a soil laboratory, and I um, figure help people understand what their soil is doing so that they can create a really healthy functioning soil that needs no man-made inputs. Of course, this is a process that takes three to five years usually, but that's uh, something that I focus on in my laboratory. And then I'm a consultant. I help people consult so that you can produce food on your own property. And I focus mostly on uh, anybody who's wanting to do anything small um, meaning up to maybe, you know, a few hundred acres is small to me. Um, I have worked with people with thousands of acres. The principles are the same. So if you're a larger farmer, the principles are the same. I can certainly help you out with those types of things. And then I have my boot camp. That's a, a three-day event normally where you come here and I teach you everything I know about uh, growing food. <laughs> but that's a fun a fun boot camp, and we have one coming up in uh, January. And then I have a book that's uh, in manuscript form, and that's my project this winter is getting that edited and all finished and published. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to our uh, purpose here tonight, our subject tonight, our things to do in the winter to prepare for the growing season. One of my main points is to help people grow enough food for their family. And that's an uncommon thing in today's world. Most people live from the grocery store, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that for sure. But a lot of people have goals to grow a lot more food than they are. And so that is the one niche I'm trying to meet is to help people. But these are the five things that I do growing food for my family and my small community here. So in December, I love to review last year's harvest. I I look at it, I figure out what we're doing, what we did, how did it go. And then number two is we plan the next year's menu because we don't just eat what comes from the garden. We eat what's on our menu. And, you know, here again, this is an odd thing for a lot of modern people. We don't <laughs> plan menus as often as maybe some cultures or the past, but uh, I do think that menus help us. Number three, we plan our next year's garden so that it will meet the needs of our menu. And then we want to focus on ordering seeds. So ordering seeds is super important. I mean, for just obvious reasons. And then number five is to organize the seeds for planting so that when the busy time of spring comes, we are prepared uh, for that planting. So number one, we're going to go into details on those five things, but number one is we review last year's harvest. So what does that mean? There's two points of what that means. Number one is did the plants grow good enough for me? So did you get enough food? 
which is number two. Did you get enough food for the family for the year? So if you, back to number one, if your plants grew really well, then your answer is yes. So just repeat what you did. That's great. You know what you're doing. It's working. So just repeat. And then down to number two, did you get enough? If your answer is yes, then that's great. Repeat what you did. You've got it figured out. Most people I work with, is, when I say, did your plants grow good for you? Not all of their plants did. People struggle. So you, we need to look at that answer, no. And what did the plants actually need? Were they growing in a functioning soil? Yes or no. And we've had a lot of classes about what a functioning soil is. Uh, but we're not going to go into that tonight. Um, I mean, we can talk about it in Q&A, but let's just move on to number two. Did they need protection from bad weather? Did you have a catastrophe and something wiped it out? Did you have late frosts or super early frosts? Or did you have snowstorms in July? Did those plants need protection? Because sometimes that can be a real problem. Number three, better management from me. Did I leave and go on a vacation in the middle of the summer? And I thought my plants would be okay, or I simply forgot about them or whatever. Sometimes it's simply just bad management. I see this a lot in people. They they have the idea of, oh, I'm going to grow all these plants. I'm going to have all this food. It's going to be great. And then they don't really plan on the management of what has to happen to get their harvest. And throughout the summer, they lose the, the interest and the high energy of the first week in May that everybody has when they're planting gardens. And it just becomes a management disaster. So on to number four and five, sometimes plants simply need some protection from pests and disease. And so these are the five big things that I see on why plants don't grow good for people. So moving on to number two, did I get enough food to feed my family? If that answer is a no, then you, you, I always think that it goes back to planning on what you need to eat, you know. You really need to think about your menu. Did you actually plan your menu to meet your needs and then plan your garden to meet your menu? And that takes us to our next slide here, and we're going to talk about the menu a little bit. So this is what I teach my students when they come here for my 17 weeks courses. We plan up out a menu the first couple of days that are here. And then the last three weeks of the 17 week course, that's what they eat from their garden, what they grew. And sometimes my students could theoretically get hungry. I mean, I'm not gonna let anybody starve to death, <laughs> but it's just fun to see if I actually was able, me as a student, if I'm actually able to grow enough food to feed myself and to have a nice, you know, I don't know what you want to call it. We could call it a balanced diet, whatever. But whatever your menu was that you planned, are you actually producing that? So if we go to number one here, what do I feed my family? And then we just need to be really honest about that. I mean, what do we eat? And there's no judgment here because that's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is creating food to feed one's family or one's community or if you're feeding, you know, if you're if you're supplying a grocery store with uh, maybe you're going to grow lettuce and you are the lettuce person or you're the radish person for a grocery store. Maybe you're taking an array of things to the farmer's market that could translate into your menu. But you just need to be super honest on what is that menu? What does it look like? And then you need to write down the specific foods that you want to grow um, in your garden. But first, you've got to figure this menu out. And people get super overwhelmed when they're thinking of an entire year and doing a menu for 52 weeks. That's the first way to stop people from doing any of this is to overwhelm them. So I always tell them, you've got to start super simple. And then you need to plan one week of your ideal diet. So you're because what I deal with is mostly people come they 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 talk to me on the phone or online or they come to one of my classes and they say man i would really love to impact my my diet by producing 30% of my food 
or 70% or 90% of my food. I have a lot of people say, oh, I want to grow 100% of my food. They really don't know what that means. And it just sounds really good. Usually, realistically, it's a nice place to start if you could grow um, 30 to 40% of your food on the first year or two. So 30% is a good spot to start. But just plan one week. What would you eat for one week that you think you may be able to grow in your garden? Uh, I'm going to the next slide here. And this is where you plan the next year's garden. So once you have your menu and your menu is figured out and you know what you're doing with your with what you actually want on your plate when you're eating, then you need to plan the garden according to that menu. The reason I came up with this is I work, I've work. i worked with people for 20 years teaching food production, and I've just had a lot of people over the years, and they say, oh, yeah, I do this big garden every year, but I don't know if I'm going to do it this year because I hate wasting food. I'm like, well, why are you wasting food? And I'm like, I don't know. Nobody in our house eats tomatoes. So, so you're growing tomatoes? And they say, yes. And I say, why are you growing tomatoes if nobody eats them? And they go, I don't know. I thought you were supposed to. So we're really not thinking it through all the time. Um, and this has helped a lot of people to be able to just see these slides that I'm going through to plan the garden by the menu. Actually grow the things that you want to eat that you are planning to eat each day of the year. So you need to select the fruits and vegetables that you actually eat. You need to select the food that will grow in your climate. And if you don't know what food grows in your climate, you're going to need to do a little bit of research on that. Um, do the math. There's a typo there on number four. Sorry. I apologize for that. But do the math to figure out how many plants you need to grow to fill up your menu. So last week was week 33. And in this class last week, so this is free. It's on my YouTube channel. It shows you how to do the math to figure this out. That's what our entire lecture was last um, last week. So, um, it's, I mean, it's pretty simple. It's pretty basic. But I do have some pointers that I think can help you get started. And then number five, you need to have a big enough garden to grow what you want um, so that your menu can actually be, uh, be filled up. Now, if you've never gardened before in your life, you probably need to just start out small get a couple of years of work under your belt to to get up to speed. If you're an advanced gardener, but you've never really thought of gardening for your menu, then just jump in with both feet and go for it. Number four is ordering seeds. So you need to figure out how many seeds you need to service your menu because your menu will tell you how much food you need. You're going to figure out how many plants you need um, you know, on our last slide, we talked about how big the garden is going to be. So you need to just figure out your seed um, choice, and then you you choose the varieties for your climate. And I always recommend um, the Landrace seeds. I did not put that on the slide here, but that's Landrace, L-A-N-D-R-A-C-E. But Landrace seeds are something that takes time. Um, it's like saving your own seeds, but breeding them to um, acclimatize to your own climate and your own conditions, your own habits, because plants will adapt to the habits of the farmer who's raising them. They will adapt to all of their climactic conditions, disease pressures, pest pressures, fertility um, issues. Plants will adapt if they have the chance, um, which means that when you order seed from somebody else, they come to you adapted to the place where they were grown, to the conditions where they were grown. And this can be a wonderful thing or it can be a dreaded thing. Um, you know, I have a friend who is the, the seed rep for Johnny's Seeds and um, she came out here. Of course, they're on the East Coast. They grow a lot of their own seeds, and they, they get seeds from um, all over the world, too. But a lot of the people where I live in the high desert in the Intermountain West, they say they were asking her, what do you have for the high desert? She's just shaking her head saying, sorry, people. I have no seeds for the high desert. 
which tells me that there's a huge societal need for some seed producers making, you know, growing seeds adapting them to our climates that are different. A lot of people say, oh, those are such harsh climates. Well, I guess so, except plants grow here all the time. And we just need seed breeders who are growing the seeds in these climates. And then we wouldn't think that. But if we go back to number three there, I do um, I do recommend that people start with the AAS winners. Um, AAS stands for All-American Selection Winners. And those, every seed catalog is going to, well, maybe not everyone, but like 99% of seed catalogs, they offer AAS winners usually. And it's an award that is awarded to a variety that has shown to do well all across um, the entire, all, all across America, in every state. If it doesn't perform well in a certain state, then they, it can't win that, um, that prize. And so AAS winners are a good place to start with seeds. And uh, let's go on to number four. I say beware of heirlooms there. I actually really love heirlooms from a cultural standpoint, from a scientific standpoint, from a, a heritage standpoint. I love heirlooms, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. What we're talking about tonight is producing enough food to feed your family for the entire year, especially if you're in the Intermountain West. Usually heirlooms come from a long ways away. They were adapted to their climates a long time ago, and their genetics are bottlenecked, meaning they're doing a specific thing, and they only know how to do it in a certain area. So, so heirlooms are wonderful for what they're for, but when it comes to feeding your family, if you're going to be growing a whole bunch of heirlooms in your, uh, in, in like in a completely different climate a whole different place than where the heirlooms were adapted to, then you may not produce a lot of food. You know, I've grown heirloom tomatoes a lot. And a lot of times over the years, we try all these heirlooms and you get, um, you know, five or six tomatoes, sometimes one tomato off an, of an heirloom, where if you have a good land race or an AAS winner or a hybrid that is that has a little bit... Um, better genetics as far as growing in your climate you're going to get um you know 20 fruits off of a plant you, you can get a lot more so i'm not saying where heirlooms are bad i'm saying know what you're getting when you get heirlooms uh if you do want to breed your own landrace seeds then you want as many heirlooms as you can get uh, because you want them to all cross pollinate and that starts, and that opens up the bottleneck, so you can grow your own landry seeds. But uh, that's a whole different class than what we're talking about tonight. Number five, the last thing you do here: order from your favorite seed company. Um, remember to order early before the seed stocks run out. This didn't used to be a problem until the year 2020, when COVID-19 was a thing, and it's been hard to get seeds in May because people are buying lots of seeds. Last year wasn't quite as bad, but a lot of seed stock still ran out. So order your seeds early. Order them now. Order before Christmas if you can. Okay, here's just a list of um, seed companies that I like to order seeds from. And uh, for those of you who have been watching my videos, you've seen this at least one time on these free classes but uh take a screenshot of this take a picture of this with your cell phone whatever i'm going to move on in a second but these are just some fun places you can go to and a lot of these have uh heirloom seeds a lot of them have um, seeds that are bred just for market growers um i don't know if any of these guys have seeds for the inner mountain west though because there aren't very many of those there are a few, but but I don't know of a seed company that's really promoting that. We need people growing seed is, is one thing we need. Okay, number five is organize the seeds for planting. There's four points to this. The first one is you need to make a chart of the dates when you're going to plant your seeds. So you need to have this, uh, you need to have the date, that, you need to know when. And for different species, it'll be different times. I like to plant my onion seeds the last week of january or the first week of february where i live 
And then a couple of weeks later, mid-February, is when I like to plant my peppers and tomatoes. And I'm growing those in a greenhouse so I can um, grow them out, you know, later on. I don't really buy transplants. I just start everything myself. So, but you need a chart to, and and then uh, number two, I, this is, I actually do all of this stuff right now in the middle of December. I get all my seed tags and on the seed tag, I write these five things. I write down the name of the plant and then I plant the date when I plant the seeds. So when I'll start the seeds and then how many seeds I'm going to plant and then the date when to transplant so but you know a tomato plant's going to grow for like four or five weeks in the seedling tray and then I transplant it into a bigger pot and then I'll transplant it later into the garden so I put all of this information onto the seed tag so you would need to either write really small or have big seed tags. I actually have big seed tags is what I have. And then I take those tags and I put the tag with the packet of seed and I put them together into a Ziploc bag. And then on the Ziploc bag, I put the date on it. Now I have a pretty big garden. So I have about five planting times. And, in, and, and so I'll have all these Ziploc bags and they'll all go in one giant Ziploc bag for the date. So I have about five giant Ziploc bags with eight to 20 small Ziploc bags inside of it. Now, it seems like a lot of trouble and a lot of work, but when springtime comes and there is an amazing amount of work to do, this makes it so simple. Because all you have to do is when the date comes, and I have an alarm on my on my calendar, so I see it on my calendar, and it says when to plant. And so when that alarm goes off, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got a plant. And so I grab my packet, and I open it up, and I know that everything in that packet gets planted. And so I just open them all, and I plant them, and it takes me about an hour and a half, and I get it all planted, and I'm done. I'm not looking at seeds. I'm not wondering what to plant. I'm not trying to figure out how many. I don't, I, all of this stuff that could be frustrating and overwhelming is already done. So when springtime comes, I just go out there and do it and it's easy. And it's the same thing when I have, because I have about 200 seed trays that sit in my greenhouse and then, but the tag is already sitting in there from when the plant came up. And so all I have to do when I'm watering those seed trays every day, I can see what date I transplant. And I'm like, oh, yeah, so there's my plan on transplanting. And then when that day comes, if the transplants actually look like they're ready to go, I'll go ahead and transplant. But I, this, I mean, I've had experiences in the past where I've been transplanting and I find a tray of something and I'm like, oh, man, this needed to be in the ground like five weeks ago. And you, can, and you can make mistakes like that. But by doing this, it makes it pretty easy. So, so anyway, that's, so that's the, that's that. I'm going to open it up for questions. If you guys have, if you guys have questions, you can write your questions into the chat or you can unmute yourself and you can ask questions and you can ask questions about anything to do with gardening, farming, ranching. Um, all things agricultural. You can even ask politic questions. <laughs> I, I don't get into politics. Um, but I do want to just point out winter boot camp is coming up January 19, 2021, 2023. So that is just in a few weeks. It's about a month away right now. And it's going to be good because we're going to be focusing on growing food in the winter in the greenhouse and that will be here in nevada on site right where i live and so that's going to be great and uh also my 17 week course it my website on the bottom of the page here it is updated and we are taking applications for students to spend 17 weeks here on site 
And I've had adults who have families and lives and careers, and they have made it clear that they did not, they would take it, except they can't leave their life for 17 weeks. So I created an online option where you can zoom in to our classes and you can do your hands-on work in your own gardens at home. So that, that exists. So if you have questions tonight, go ahead and put it in the chat. Type it in there, and I'll read those, and we can discuss them. Or you can just unmute. Okay, Stacy said, we don't have a greenhouse. Any suggestions? Well, do you want a greenhouse? And where do you live? You know, if you're living south, maybe you don't need a greenhouse. Um, if you just want to have a big garden outside, you've got to remember that most of human life has lived without greenhouses. So Leighton, Utah, I'm glad you got eight inches of snow. That's wonderful. We need all the snow we can get right now to break this drought we're in. Um, so there's a lot you can do with root cellaring, you know. You can grow a lot of fun things that will do well and store for a long time in a root cellar. And that it goes back to your menu, you know, what do you eat? But I'll just tell you what I eat. I eat potatoes. They last through the winter very good. Um, the variety that lasts the longest, I have a red variety with a yellow flesh. It's called Valerie, and it lasts very, very long. Like it was hardly growing eyes last year when I got my seed potatoes out of the cellar to plant them in, in May. They were still firm and doing very good. So that was exciting. And there's another uh, potato. It's a brown potato with a yellow flesh called Sunrise Gold. And they have excellent keeping qualities. So if you can, if you have a root cellar of some kind underground, and you can keep those between like 38 degrees up to like, you know, under 50, anywhere in the 40 degree range. Those potatoes will last really well. You never want to let potatoes freeze, though. If they're freezing, that's bad because they, they, they change and they can come somewhat toxic. How do you unmute? You, um... I can unmute you. Hold on a second. <laughs> I found it. <laughs> you got it. Go ahead and talk, Stacy. Um, yeah, we're in the city. Um, we don't have a root cellar. I do have, you know, the under the front porch storage area, but it don't. It only gets down to about fifty, I think, in the winter. Okay. Um, yeah. I, we've we've had gardens before. Um. And then I went back to work and didn't, and and now I'm retired, and so I need to do get back to gardening. Um, we're on we're on just under an acre, so it's not huge, but it's we've got space. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can keep for a long time in the root cellar. If you grow the cabbages, you know, you start them in the summer instead of the springtime, so that they're ripening right before the snow flies. Uh, some of those big giant cabbages, your late flat dutches, and there's a bunch of varieties, but you just read the seed catalogs and they'll give you the descriptions of the ones that are best for storage over winter and pull the whole plant up by the root on a cabbage when you're going to put it in the root cellar. You pull it up by the root, shake a little dirt off, and then you just hang it upside down. So tie a string around the root and you can hang them from the rafters. They store a long time that way in a root cellar. Uh, the key to root cellaring is you need a good source of humidity, meaning a couple of buckets of water sitting in there so that okay. some humidity can stay in there. And you got to keep your temperatures pretty low, you know, in the 40 degree range. And usually if you dig in the ground, you're you're in the 50s. So so that's pretty good. And you need airflow too, or you start can start growing some mold. But there's great books and resources on how to build build root cellars so, you so just... the, my original question you were talking about starting your um your seeds in a greenhouse yeah so i don't have a greenhouse we one year tried to put up a cheap one and the wind just demolished it before we even used it yeah that's what happens to cheap greenhouses <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> yeah 
Um, you you can start a few starts in a window of the house, but I really don't recommend that. Although they can produce some food, but the plants think they have no light. That's why if if your plants are stretching, I'm sure you've had a plant in the window and it goes toward the window. Right. So that's a response. We call that a tropism, a phototropism in plants. But when they do that, it's telling you that the plant is stressed and it's not going to be growing correctly. It's putting its energies into lowering stress instead of just growing. So you could use uh, supplemental grow lights. You know, you, they, they're selling all kinds of fancy grow lights. There's a thousand companies out there wanting to sell you a grow light. But uh, I like to grow... I just like to grow it in the greenhouse. Obviously, you don't have one, uh, but there are a lot of ways that you can you can produce. You know, I usually have just put seeds in the ground, but it's usually in May when I start. Yeah, and that's a good idea. You know, if if you're good at doing that, you know, go right ahead. So, anyway, you have any other questions, Stacy? Oh, well, I'll let somebody else talk. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? John said, how much does the online course cost? Are you talking about the 17-week online course? It's the same price as the – it's the same class. It's the same price. It's $3,500. I, I am – I am uh, – I am developing an online course that'll be different, but it's going to be at least a year before I get that one done. But this one is the very same class. You're just going to be able to stay at home and uh, and you would. I'll just zoom you into the daily classes that we do. So, so that's how that works. Okay. All right, Ron, I don't think I've seen you on our classes tonight, or I mean ever before. Are you new here? Yes, I am new here. My wife, Holly, is next to me. You can't quite see. She's there somewhere. There she I don't is. show up very well. <laughs> okay, well, good. I'm so, glad you guys are on. Thank you. Welcome. We stumbled on upon you the last few days. We uh, have some land in uh, Payette, Idaho. We're wanting to do a big garden initially, so we're going to be coming back a lot to learn what to do. Okay, good. Sounds good. Do you have any questions tonight? Holly? Not that I know of right now. We're le we're learning. Yeah, we need to research our our um our new position because it's a it's a new environment for us. It's a high desert and we're not used to that. So Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Neighbors are the best thing. Go talk to lots of neighbors who have gardens. The yes. older they good are, idea. the older they are, usually the better. If you can find some ninety-year-old people who were growing food, you know, way back in the day, those are a, a, a great, valuable resource. Usually, the the conversation starts out of, "Oh, I don't know why you'd want a garden; it's so much work." But just keep talking <laughs> to these people, and and eventually they will come around, and you will. They are a wealth of knowledge about your local area. That's great. Awesome. All right. Sounds good. All right. John, so, any questions tonight? Yeah, yeah, I do. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one was you said land race seeds. Yeah, the land race know. seeds, yeah. How's that spelled? Race. Land race, L-A-N-D-R-A-C-E, -E, like land race. Okay, and that's what kind of seed is that again? Um, okay, so I'll give you a brief history. So we've got heirloom seeds, yeah. you've got open pollinated seeds, you've got hybrid seeds, you got GMO seeds, and you got landrace seeds. Those are the five classes of seeds that I know about. Uh, your heirloom seeds have a cultural and historical significance, and sometimes it's a family significance. And if, if you you got to be careful who you're talking to. If you say you don't like heirloom seeds because people take it very personally if they have a tomato that they brought from Italy and it's been in the family for 800 years, which isn't true because um, tomatoes haven't been in Italy that long because they came from the New World. But it, <laughs> but they think it has. <laughs> you tell them it hasn't and they'll argue with you. 
so open pollinated seeds are those are just seeds that will reproduce themselves if you save the seed and plant it it reproduces itself the same way an, an heirloom is an open pollinated but an open pollinated doesn't necessarily have a cultural or historical significance so that's the difference between those two and then you've got uh hybrid seeds and that's where you take um two different parents so you can have a yellow tomato and a red tomato and you cross them and they and then you plant the seeds from the fruit from their offspring and then that's that first generation and when you plant that f1 f1 it means just um filial which means family so the f1 hybrid seed it will give you a consistent result but then if you plant seeds from that one, it opens up the genetics and you get a whole bunch of weird things. And people talk about frankenfruits and all these strange things. And so you can't save hybrid seed. You can certainly save it and grow it. It just doesn't give you a, a, a reliable, consistent, predictable crop. So you have to buy the new, uh, like every year you would have to buy that same hybrid seed that's developed by a seed breeder who knew what they were doing so that you get the the characteristics you want in that fruit or vegetable okay so that is um so that's the the yeah the one i just said and then there's gmo and those ones that are spliced the genes are spliced together in a laboratory and I don't even grow any of those. There's a lot of people who say they're evil. There's a lot of people who say they're going to save the world. But they're a new invention in the last, uh, you know, a few decades. Uh, high, there are the, I mean, the GMOs are a new thing. And it's big business that are dealing with those. Although you can buy, you can go to the store and buy them in seed packets. You can buy GMO seeds that have, have the um, attributes of other, other things. Um, and then the last one would be the landrace seed. Now, a landrace is uh, a seed that is locally adapted. And you've heard me talking about saving seeds before, John. What I'm doing yeah. with all my seed um, growing, it is landrace seeds. So let me just give you an example. Let's just say I want to um, grow a cantaloupe, but I live in a high mountain valley. And my can and cantaloupes won't grow here because I only have an 80 day growing season and the only cantaloupe varieties I can find ripen after 90 days. So that just doesn't work. So what I would do is I would buy a seed packet of every variety that I can get of cantaloupes. So maybe I would get 300 varieties. Now, let me be clear. I'm going to have open pollinated cantaloupes. I'm going to have um heirloom cantaloupes i'm gonna have hybrid cantaloupes i want as many varieties as i can possibly get and i mix up all the seed and i plant my acre of cantaloupes and then i watch them throughout the year and because it's a harsh climate the weather is going to wipe out a whole bunch of them and that's natural and normal and good and then, and that's what we want because we are trying to adapt it to our climate. So if they're not going to survive in the climate, we don't want their genetics. And so the first year doing this, you may get one or two fruits from an acre that produce a viable seed and they probably didn't ripen. They probably didn't taste good. But what did happen is there would be quite a few fathers, meaning the male flowers of a lot of the different varieties would have helped to pollinate the one that produced viable seed. So you take the viable seed and then you plant your acre again the next year. Well, the next year, the genetics are opened up because now you have all kinds of hybrids out there because it was all mixed up. And then that second year, let's say you get 10 fruits that have viable seeds, but one of them actually ripened and you tasted it and it tasted sort of good. On a scale of one to 10, it was a five in flavor. So it wasn't great, but it was okay. And so you would only save the seeds from that one plant that made the ripe fruit. The third year, you plant the entire acre to that 
uh, to just with those seeds from that one fruit. Now this year, it is working out. The genetics are working out right because it's still in the hybrid stage. Blah blah blah, and you are going to be producing maybe maybe fifty fruits that ripen. And now it gets exciting because you can taste every one of those fruits and you only save the one or two fruits that taste the very best. And uh, and then, you know, by year five, your genetics are going to start to stabilize. And they are going to get to a point where your fruits are starting to look the same size, the same color, the same shape the same basic flavor can be expected. And on year 10, you keep going. And by year 10, you're gonna, you will basically have developed your own variety of uh, cantaloupe. Uh, so right? did you do that with cantaloupe this year? I, I mean, I saw you cutting up watermelon, for example. Y yeah. That's what you were trying to do with watermelon. Yeah, so all of my Patreon videos where I, I'm showing those videos, Save and Seed, every one of these is exactly what I just explained. The mm -hmm. corn, the melons, the cucumbers, the tomatoes, onions, all of these I've done this with. Now, I don't always go out and get hundreds of varieties to start with, but I, I, it depends what we're trying to do and trying to accomplish. So, but anyway, that's land race for you. So it sounds complicated unless you're a mad scientist like me. And then it's just a lot of fun. Would Would you uh, have your chart available uh, just as a model sample that uh, one could look at? And uh, I know your uh, season is a little bit different than what mine is, but... Uh, okay, what chart probably... are we talking about, John? What chart? Well, you were saying, you were saying that uh, what you do is uh, calendar all your seed planting. And you use a chart or a calendar in order to do that. And so you uh, uh, you schedule when you're gonna when you're gonna plant any any particular seedling that you've already you know when you you're gonna you've got three hundred you said three hundred uh, uh, yeah. trays started. Um. Let me yeah. let me see. Can can you see my screen right now? I can see you here. Okay, let me. I need to. I pulled this. I pulled up a chart. My uh, I don't have a chart that shows everything you're talking about, but right. I do have a chart. I'm just trying to screen share real quick. I can't talk and do stuff at the same time. I'm not ignoring anyone. That would be nice if you had a chart that you could share with all of us. So when you do your planning this December, maybe I you do have share charts. With us. You probably need to sign up for one of my classes. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I don't know where my charts are at. Hold on. Okay, screen share. Okay. All right. What do you see right now? Oh, that's Is the wrong it? one. Hold on. Here's a chart. Okay, can you see this chart? Yeah. It says it says 2023 quantifiable garden plans, goals for greenhouse. Okay, so there's this one and that one. So these are my four goals for this year. This is similar to what I was talking about, but not really. Um, but this is the chart I'm using to do my plan this year. So I've got my details about my goal. So if you can see my cursor right here, yeah. uh, I'm increasing the five spheres in my soil, which we've talked about. And I want to, one of my main things is lowering compaction because I have a lot of soil compaction. That's a big problem for me. Um, and then my management practices, here's what I'm actually going to do. And then here's my methods right here of how I'm going to do this. So this is the first chart that I'm using to um, get to where I need to be. But I'm going to go to the next slide that's a little bit more relevant to what you're talking about. So my food chart here, 
I'm producing my food goal. I mean, I want to produce 90% of our food this year. Last year, our goal was 80%. We got pretty close, but we were probably at 75. But I think with some special, some special work, I can bump it up to 90. Um, but anyway, I don't know. This is this is a chart. <laughs> yeah, it gives an idea. You know, it, it would just be nice to know uh, why you talked about onions in February, for example. Yeah, I'm I'm actually gonna make a Patreon video about that. It should be coming out in the next two weeks. All right. Okay. So, so that'll be on my Patreon. It'll be. A, I'm gonna do a video, and I am creating a chart. Let me unshare this screen and I'm going to go grab. I The only time I ever use a computer is for teaching. I never use a computer for my own stuff. Okay, can you still see the chart? No. Okay, good. So you can see me now? Yeah. Oh, good. So I'm going to grab my chart and I'll stick it in the camera and hopefully you can see it. All right, I can't find it. Sorry, John. It's That's hidden okay. away. I don't know. It's in a stack of papers somewhere, but I'm gonna find it. Um, okay. Can here's so can you see this? It's not in focus, but uh, oh, there we go. That's no. Is that better? Okay. Move it up farther away, maybe. A little further. A right little there. further. No. Okay. All right. Can't see it no. yet. Probably not going to work very good. <laughs> but anyway, that's what my chart looks like. My charts oh. are just these handwritten things, and then I just stick them on the wall. I just I'm a I'm an old time pencil and paper guy, and I just write it down and I stick it on the wall, and then that's what that's just how I do it, you know. Okay. That's, that's just how I manage. So. Well, I mean, if you start doing videos that say this is. A good time to start your onions, and here's how I do well, it. Well, the problem is, I I have, I mean, not very very many people get on this free class, but I mean, I have a lot of people across the country watching me, and it's going to be different everywhere you live, you know. I mean, like Utah Valley, Salt Lake Valley is going to be different than where I am in Clover Valley, and I mean, I got a guy in Ely that's always wanting information. I've got people in Southern California. I got people in uh, Oregon in the Willamette Valley. I got people in North Carolina. So I, I just, you know, I'm a busy guy and I can't write everybody's chart of when they need to do stuff in every place. <laughs> that becomes impossible. So, I mean, so you're in Missouri part of the time and you're in Northern Utah part of the time, John. And so it's going to be, and that, those are two different things. I mean, basically the first of May is gardening season, but you know, it could change. Just, I mean, everywhere you go changes. Every, even within a city, you have microclimates. Right. So, yeah. anyway. All right. It's been fun tonight. Does anybody else have any more questions? Um, I do, William. I'd All like right. to know um, what kind of tags you get and what do you use for labeling? Because a lot of my pens, I think they're permanent ink. Yeah. And lo and behold, it's gone. Yeah. So permanent ink is a joke. If, yeah. if if sun hits permanent ink, it is not permanent. It stays there for um, about six weeks max. Yeah. So I just use uh, the little plastic. You can just get those little tiny plastic blank tags. Yes. A lot of people yes. are against plastic because it's somehow it's supposed to ruin the environment. But I don't have a problem with it because I bought some tags. It cost me $13 for a thousand of those about 10 years ago. I'm still using them. Wow. And, and here's why I'm still using them because I use a number two pencil, a plain oh. old cheap number two pencil. You write it on there. You squirt it with water. It doesn't come off. 
the sun hits it, it doesn't come off. But next year, when you want to reuse that tag, you just grab it with your fingers and just a little bit of oil on your fingers will take that right off. And it's a blank brand new tag again. And you write on it again for this year with your number two pencil. So you find that the pencil doesn't go away. That's what I've found. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and the brand that you got, are they kind of rough on one side and smooth on the other? A little bit, but they, the pencil stays on both sides, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Well, that's great. And, Good. and you can get those. Uh, I just get them on Amazon. I think yeah. You can just order those okay. online. You can probably a lot of places you can get them. There's horticultural okay. places, suppliers where you can get them too. Sure. Thank you. You bet. So this is a really important question. Uh, right. Do you use the same Zoom number every every week? No, I don't because I can only schedule 20 at a time. Uh, okay. Zoom doesn't let you do more than 20 at a time. And in fact, th this set is coming in the next three or four weeks. I'm going to have to have a new link. So, But okay. like I always tell people, I always put it on Facebook every week. Every all week. right every week okay every thursday i put my thing on facebook telling people where the link the i was i was sure impressed by that picture of the apricot or apricot or, or whatever cottage it is oh yeah the one on facebook or yeah, the one who tonight made, who, what what the one tonight yeah mm -hmm. who took it i took that yeah oh well i just took that a week ago it's a really yeah. nice picture. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, for all, those of us that are late, uh, can you show us the first two uh, uh, screens that you had? Yeah, John, you're a professor at a college, right? Uh, I guess I am. Well, <laughs> do you show students that are late to your classes? <laughs> do you back up and show them when they're late? Yeah. <laughs> do you? <laughs> Oh dear, you got me. Okay, there's a. There we go. That's the first one. Okay, uh, there it is. Take a screenshot. You got it. I got it. I got it. Got it. Second one. There's your picture. Oh, that's great. And look at the man with the beard. That's yeah. That's me. I have my camera off so often when I do these that I thought I should put my picture up there. Okay. I'm... Okay. There's number two. All right. I got it. There's another one. Oh, I got that one already. Did you get this one? Uh, no, I did just now, though. Okay, and then that was just the menu of the ones we went through. Okay. So this Thank is you. my first one, second, third, fourth, fifth. Sixth. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. There you go. William, I do have another question. Uh, if we don't have a greenhouse, and many of us don't, um, and we're starting seeds indoors <laughs> with grow lights, do you put... Um, a heated mat under your seed trays? Uh, yeah, it just depends on the temperature of your house. But yes, it's a good idea. It, they will grow um, quicker that way. Okay, and if you, uh, what temperature of the house is well, the best? What, what, I mean, it depends what seeds you're sprouting. If you're sprouting brassicas, they want to be a little bit cooler and, you know, 60, 70. Okay range if you're um, sprouting hot weather crops they want to be up there in the 70 and 80 range okay so that's where you would need a seed uh, i mean yeah, yeah, you're a, a mat. better for tomatoes peppers and all the cucurbits okay like, and since you're doing everything in the greenhouse i guess you don't have any good source for um for the seed tray mats do you the the heating mat yeah you don't have Amazon. a good source for those. oh okay a lot Alrighty. of people hate Amazon, so maybe they hate me too, but it's so <laughs> easy, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, good. That's the kind of thing we need to be thinking of right now too, along with buying our seeds. Is, yeah. You know, how many seed trays do you have? And do you have enough to support all of the things that you want to plant? And That's right. Things, you need to do the math. Yep. Matt. And then grow lights. Um, Amazon again too. Yeah, uh, of course. I always say Amazon because I'm talking to a worldwide audience. You know, I got people all sure. over. But 
if you have a if you have a mom and pop garden center around, support those people. We need those people in our local areas. You go support your local people. That's the best place to get stuff. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's what I really think. But yeah, but if I told you to come to my local place, nobody's coming to Elko, Nevada if you're living in Missouri <laughs> and North Carolina. I mean, I have stuff for sale too, but I don't even promote that very good. If you need earthworms, I've got earthworms and everybody needs well, them. We'll be there next week. Yeah. Do you have, <laughs> do you have okay. any earthworms? Yeah, I got them. He'll ready ship them. He'll mail them to you, John. You don't have to go there. Okay, uh, let's wrap this up for the night. If you have another question, I can answer it. If not, we will see you next week. I have another silly one. Where do the earthworms go during winter? Just further down in the ground? Yeah, they just burrow down below the frost level. And then they break up the dirt down there too. Yeah, yep. Okay. Earthworms are your best, they're your best friend. Yes, they are. Okay. okay, so Thank I have you. a question for you guys. So I got three people on here live tonight, more than, well, three families, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, what subject do you want me to talk about next week? Oh, boy, everything. <laughs> we, we have a pasture we've got to create into a garden. And so, okay. you know, so we need to walk through all the process. What's the soil like? What's, you know, what's, we've got a well, we've got water, if they have that tested, I guess. So where do we start that's what we're doing so, all right yeah. i can talk about that next week let me make a note right now and i'm going to sign off and we will see you guys next week well, I, want, you, I want to see a chart okay. nice to meet you all <laughs> john you need to sign up for my class and you'll have more charts um, than you want to see and, and john <laughs> you can go by um last frost date first frost date Mm -hmm. um and then you count backwards yeah that's that's a good way to for how long it's going to take out. your well, stuff to sprout can i trust that yep advisor can you trust that the dates on the internet are going to be when it oh, or that, that that no no oh, that you can't trust that <laughs> but you can get close it's a good place to start okay it's been fun tonight everybody Thank see you, you later Thank, Thank you, you William. Bye-bye. Well. Good to meet you all.